Hey there, we're on our fourth and final of the River Valley Civilization topic talks here, and today we're doing the Huang O. Um, and let me just go ahead and warn you, I'm sure of all the River Valley Civilizations that we've studied and of all the different historical periods that we're going to talk about in our history, I will probably brutalize the pronunciation of, of these names more, more than any other. So just, you know, go ahead and uh, figure out that you got to probably get a better source of that pronunciation than yours truly. So um, try my best. Uh, I do know that uh, it's the Huang Ho as spelled here on the board. That's the pronunciation as I've been told by people who are smarter than me. Um, the location here, again, we're using our chart. We're using our information chart here for this to track certain evidences of civilization. The location is East Asia and what today we would call China. Uh, it would not be referred to as China for uh, several centuries after the time period we're studying, um, but that is the location. Um, this Huanghe River, more specifically, uh, the Yellow River, as it's often referred to, to um, using the uh, silk, the yellow silk-colored loess, as again probably mispronouncing that L O E S S, um, flows into um, uh, the Pacific Ocean there. Uh, the, the floods are very dangerous here. So very unlike the Nile, probably a little bit more like the Tigris and Euphrates. Um, but the geographic barrier surrounding it would be, uh, you know, of course, water mountains, desert, and then plateau. The Tibetan plateau found to the west would probably limit contact with the civilization for some time, um, as well as protect them. Uh, cities. Um, built out of wood. The most ancient of the cities located, I believe, is that of Anyang. Um, and uh, they built walls just like a lot of other places that we have studied and will study. Uh, the walls would be fortified or protected uh, initially with earth. Um, it would take a lot of labor, which leads us to believe that there was a tremendous amount of authority, a tremendous amount of power by whoever was governing or, or leading this civilization. Um, re religion of this region, very different here. So far we've, we've seen a lot of polytheistic fates where the gods were very, uh, um, you know, uh, sources of, of forces of nature. The, the gods here or the worship here would be very closely linked to religion. So the, the religion, the, the spirit, the worship of spirits rather of the ancestors uh, could bring about good or bad fortune. There was considered to be a uh, supreme God that would need interpretation by priests as to what that God wanted or, or how, how to communicate with that God. Um, government of this region would be uh, very, very quickly um, orchestrated into a dynastic rule as we've talked about. Uh, the Shia, XIA, um, is legendary. There's not a lot of evidence to suggest it actually did happen at this point, but, but by 1700 BC up to about 1000 BC, the Shang Dynasty would be uh, the ruling class. So that, that's, that's a pretty good length of time to be ruled by one family. Um, these ruling classes or these ruling families, uh, by the time we get to the Zhou uh, Dynasty, which is here, Z-H-O-U, um, they would have received what is called a mandate of heaven. So if you could convince the population that your, your family was uh, ruling according to the wishes of the ancestors, the wishes of the gods, then you had that authority. And calling to question that authority or that mandate, if you will, um, probably made the population ready for a change when it came to government. Um, as far as trade goes, uh, there would be agricultural products for the most part. Uh, it would take some time before what we would consider to be trade with the outside world to take place, and we're going to be talking about much later the Silk Road. Um, initially, it's going to be within the, the regions of uh, the River Valley civilizations of today, what we call China. Um, their society would be divided very sharply between peasants and nobles. The nobles, of course, would be the landowners. And this type of system is often referred to as feudalism. And the feudalism is based on loyalty. The, the nobles, of course, provide uh, the land for the peasants to work. The peasants provide, and they protect them. And the peasants, of course, provide 
um, you know, the work and the labor and the, the assets that have been and resources that have been accrued from that work. Um, a writing system or written language, of course, would be the characters um, that uh, are, are still uh, used in, in Chinese society today or communication today. Each symbol is a character, rather, is a syllable of the language. Um, and the interesting thing here is no matter the different languages that are spoken in the region, all the characters were the same. So this is going to allow for some unification uh, through communication. Uh, it was interesting to note that just to be literate in the language, the written language, one must learn up to 1,500 symbols or characters. But to be a scholar in the, in the language, you had to know as many as 10,000, um, which you can imagine is very difficult to do. So a uh, pretty esteemed class there. Um, the Zhou Dynasty, finally, which would rule from uh, 1027 to 256 BC, so for again about an 800 year period, that's a pretty long time. Uh, their achievements would be things like uh, the building of roads and canals to aid with agriculture and trade, uh, the coining of money uh, instead of using farm products and so forth, but the actual the use of, of coins to purchase in the economy, uh, and even the use of iron. And this is pretty significant because iron would not come to Europe for uh, about another thousand years. It would not be the Middle Ages or more than a thousand years. It wouldn't be until the Middle Ages till iron would come to Europe. So uh, pretty remarkable civilization here along the Huang Ho. And uh, that concludes our look. So thanks a lot.